Uh, good afternoon. Wow. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Hearing my voice. Uh, thanks for coming. I was I was worried that no one will show up after lunch for three hour tutorial. I was debating whether we should have done it at one and a half hour. So it's nice to see you. I hope you I won't lose you after the first and a half first part. Uh, but thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Murat Kantarjolo. I'm a professor at the University of Texas at Dallas. So if you come to CCS next year, that's where where it will be in Dallas. Uh, I, I work on data security, privacy, and the intersection of data mining, security, and privacy, and this is an area that we've been working on, but mainly publishing data mining topic. Uh, and uh, my uh, collaborator, Boe Zee, she, she's a professor at uh, uh, Purdue University in statistics department, and we were looking into ap applying big data for what we call adversarial data mining. So hopefully I will try to uh, tell, give you some background on all these topics from different uh, views. Uh, so, and these slides were kind of helped, uh, Dr. Yanzo, she's a research scientist in my group who helped with the slides. Uh, so let me start, what's the hype, what's going on? Uh, there is a big hype in uh, big data in, in US at least, I don't know, probably in Europe as well in terms of uh, it's, it's kind of seen as a magical dust to solve many problems. And of course, cybersecurity is one of those uh, areas that's been uh, considered. And uh, you've seen these kind of uh, news uh, articles, etc. over the years. Uh, this is one example, maybe you've seen others. Uh, for example, they say that, like this is from Gartner, they will say that the big data will revolutionize cybersecurity in the next two years. I don't know whether it's revolutionized. It's 2014, now it's 16. I don't know whether the revolution happened. Uh, but clearly, uh, there is all this uh, hype about uh, how uh, and how long it will take and how we can use the big data uh, for cybersecurity. Furthermore, this hype actually kind of matched with, uh, I would say, what's going on in the venture space. Uh, and the idea is uh, there are many startups and VC funding for using big data analytics for cybersecurity. And there are many, many companies who are, who are doing uh, big data analytics for cybersecurity, including like IBM has products, uh, HP, Splunk, and so on. And uh, there are, I, I think, 100 million or more VC money is invested in startups uh, who are doing big data analytics. So the question is, of course, what's different uh, for uh, cybersecurity when you have data analytics? So there's all these startups and Google doing data analytics for many, many years, let's say. So what's the new in, in cybersecurity and what's the, what does uh, the new aspects? So that will be the really the main I would say the motivation for this talk. So I'll try to convince you that cybersecurity is slightly different. Uh, first, of course, why this type is happening, I guess there is lots of more data available uh, in the recent years. F why? Because first of all, we can capture those data points. Uh, for example, we can have lots of malware samples. I think Microsoft has a challenge, like data mining challenge on trying to understand uh, the different malware types, and I think the winner has like 99.99 accuracy or something. Uh, so you have so much data gathered about, let's say, malware. Now there are so many uh, companies selling tools that log almost every activity on either a device or on your mobile device, and there are even uh, new tools coming into play where you can capture more and more data about your system, about the individuals on your system, what these individuals are doing and uh, how they are mining this data and what they are doing with it. So there are all this data coming from the different system areas. This, the other things, of course, is file laws were there and there are more companies who are getting some products on those where they, they gather this network data, network uh, related events and you, they capture that and they try to capture it at, at a, even increasing, I would say, detail. So that's also bringing lots of more new data. And there are also sensors happening. I guess this is coming from the maybe IoT domain. Now you will have more devices and those devices will be also 
bringing more data. And of course, you may want to use this data to figure out whether something is going wrong, whether uh, you know, this IoT device has been hacked or captured and so on. So the other, I would say, the changing factor is that uh, not only big data becomes popular, but there is more data about cybersecurity. Of course, as a research challenge, it's hard to access most of these data. And I think that's a, a problem uh, for researchers. So it's, it's very hard to get real firewall logs or if you don't do it by yourself. But still, all this data is coming. So. Of course, the first question comes to mind is at least uh, I've talked to some uh, over the years, some VC people as well. So what's the new about cybersecurity, for example? Why can't we just get whatever your favorite data mining tool or your system, let's say, and throw, throw the data mining tool on it and try to predict? Okay. And, and I think at least th this is my view is that uh, we have this adversary in the cybersecurity domain. And there are some other domains as well where machine learning data mining is applied, such as Homeland Security. But in all, most of the interesting cybersecurity related things such as intrusion detection, uh, fraud detection, uh, spam, malware, etc., you have an adversary. So this really, uh, from traditional data mining point of view, it's, it's uh, a big change, according to me, because here you have this active adversary who tries to avoid being detected and who tries to manipulate the data mining process. So this is a quite different, different than, let's say, applying data mining machine learning to detect Higgs bosons in CERN labs, because I don't think, as far as I know, I'm not a physicist, but Higgs boson tried to hide its existence you know, from the data. But here uh, in the cybersecurity domain, that's, that's a big challenge. So this adaptive active adversary. So, so basically, uh, new solutions really needed to address this problem from machine learning point of view, and people look into this actually. That's the part of the survey that I will summarize. I'm at least, uh, I would like to bring your attention of what in the machine learning data mining community has done uh, on this area, and, um, and then talk about some of how it could be maybe applied in practice later. Uh, so the, the standard, deviation, as I'm mentioning, a little bit more technical, uh, is that most of the machine learning techniques have this IID independent identical distribution assumption. So in other words, what you have seen in your test or training data, in other words, what data you've collected may look similar in the future. So it's coming from the same distribution. But of course, uh, this is just one example, uh, and we will see a few other attacks. But when you have uh, more uh, active adversaries, what you have seen may, may change down the road. So in this, in this example, uh, the adversary may have, uh, you, you may see this data set, for example, and you can build a model to classify good versus bad. Let's say the red is the uh, bad ones and the greens are the good ones. And you can build a classifier, which is, uh, the line here is a simple example or, of a machine learning model that you can learn and build. But of course, once you build this, this independent IID assumption may not be correct anymore because during the test time, the attacker may change some of the features. For example, even though the data look like distributed this way when you were building your model based on the data you have collected, but when you deploy your model, your distribution, for example, may change, and some of the points have maybe passing the classifier now. So this in the IID type of assumptions or the assumption of stationary process that's been heavily used in machine learning traditional tools may not be uh, correct anymore. So now the question is how you should how should this uh, handled? Uh, and this kind of, uh, the, the, at least I used to give this example a lot and still, is that you see this in many cybersecurity domains, in spam filtering, for example. If you look at the evolution, early, evolu early spam filters, for example, were used for a world Viagra, for example. Viagra was highly likely to be a spam, uh, right? Because you don't have legitimate emails who are, send, who are writing uh, Viagra in it. But uh, the spammers quickly learned to misspell and write Viagra in many, many different ways. 
So what you have seen in your data there, you have wrote Viagra, for example, for spam filter detection, suddenly uh, was not very useful because you are now having an adaptive attacker who is changing its uh, behavior and writing Viagra in many, many different ways. So this is kind of this scenario. So you had seen some emails where there is some Viagra word in it, and suddenly that Viagra is misspelled. Of course, this is a simple mod manipulation, and uh, people, uh, attackers, come up with many, many more. So now the question is how you could model this adaptive behavior by the attacker. And uh, for those who know a little bit more uh, machine learning data mining, Again, I'm, 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 I'm trying to keep the knowledge in machine learning very limited, uh, and then there are some pointers uh, at the end, uh, and I will share the slides as well so you can look at those papers. But for more advanced uh, know, uh, peop uh, people who has more advanced background, uh, it's not uh, concept drift. Uh, there is lots of work uh, going on in machine learning data mining to uh, understand changing concepts. So in some domains, like in social media, etc., people's tastes evolve over time. So there is lots of work on how you could evolve your machine learning models over time as the concept is changing, like what the people's taste is changing, what they like is changing. But this is not really a concept in the in this scenario because the adversary on purpose is changing its behavior. <coughs> and now, the, of course, there is another line of work in machine learning called online learning. And here, the idea of online learning is you want to update your model by not seeing entire data at once, but you, you keep seeing data coming. There, there are variants of it like stream mining as well. I, I just captured them on, under one umbrella called online learning is that the, uh, you try to learn by only seeing few instances and update your model as you see more and more data points. But again, the online learning kind of assumes that although there may be a concept drift in the online learning scenario as well, still it's not about adaptive behavior, adaptive uh, uh, adversary, but it's more on the, on the side of how we can build the model as we see more data in a streaming fashion. So the biggest difference is here is that the attacker may avoid being detected by uh, manipulating the data or its own features in two distinct time. So one is the training time. In other words, when the data that you, you capture to build your models uh, could, could be could be not pure data. So this is kind of like a data poisoning attack type of thing. So in other words, you get some data where the attacker manipulated early on via different means <coughs> for, uh, and therefore uh, it will impact the machine learning data analytics process. So an example would be is that if a person collecting arbitrarily uh, let's say, Twitter accounts to build social media uh, related, uh, let's say, spam filtering. Some of these collected Twitter accounts by itself may be manipulated by the attacker so that the model that you learn may not be accurate. So this is the uh, deliberate intervention during uh, training time. And the other thing is that I think more relevant is the test time. So the features uh, that you use and you think it's important may be, may be uh, modified by the attacker. So this is an attack during the test time. An example <coughs> would be is, uh, you, I mean, you can, you can see this in uh, many scenarios, but uh, Viagra example was one, one where the attacker, for example, changed email content. In the, t in the case of spam filtering, uh, the spammers have done lots of uh, good word attacks. In other words, add lots of words to spam emails where the, those words are not associated with spam. So the emails look uh, like a legitimate email. 
So these are the type of adaptation is coming. So I'm, I'm trying to convince you that this is really different because of this adversary. An adversary can uh, manipulate certain phases of the uh, data analytics uh, pipeline to avoid being detected, like the training time or the test time. So uh, this, this be brings a question, and there are people try to answer this, at least somewhat theoretically and also, I think, practically. If this is a game between data miner and the adversary, and how we should really model uh, this game, and especially how we should model this adversary's uh, adaptive behavior, and this uh, training time, what, what I mean by is like doing our data model building or uh, machine learning process, and the deployment time or the test time. I'll use training and test to differentiate these two. Uh, so, uh, of course, one solution idea occurs is that, and this is still relevant, you can really consistently change your model. So if you come up with a new attack, new, uh, new uh, uh, adaptive behavior, maybe you, re you rebuild your data mining model. And I think uh, there were <coughs> there were some talks I get here uh, yesterday talk about uh, how you could, for example, mine online blocks to come up new features to detect, let's say, m uh, new malware. So you can use something like that to build a new model once you have a new malware, maybe, and use it to detect. But of course, this, this is always a catching up type of scenario. So once you figure out something new happening, then you adapt. So the questions, uh, at least, people try to answer more on the theoretical or machine learning side, data mining side was really how to model this adaptive behavior. I mean, can we go at least a few steps ahead? Instead of consistently changing and catching up, can we build machine learning models that are more resistant to this kind of adaptive behavior? And what does that mean? And uh, if, this is a, if you think about this is a game and an arm race, race between the an adversary who tries to avoid being detected and a machine learning data mining uh, based model who tries to detect such a behavior. Uh, does this game ever end? So what, what's the end result would be? So for example, can we detect some certain attacks using this kind of automated models? Uh, of course, at the end you can reach some undecidability stuff like many cases, but what's the the end result for certain task, or can we predict it? Of course, uh, for those who know game theory a little bit, when you talk about games, there is this equilibrium discussion. So what would be the equilibrium look like if there is one? And uh, it's where the attacker and the machine learning model reach an equilibrium. So I'm going to try to, uh, so this is the questions we try to discuss based on the existing research. And in the remainder uh, of the uh, talk, I'll try to first look into some foundational results and models to reason about this learning in the presence of an active adversary. Uh, there will be lots of equations, but uh, don't be discouraged. <laughs> I'll just try to give intuitions and there will be no proofs, even though you see theorems. And those theorems are just to capture some results, so there will be no proofs or things. And I'll try to minimize machine learning knowledge, but I'll try to at least give some insights about for the people who try to do that. Then uh, there were some, uh, I will, I'm going to talk about the, some recent uh, techniques developed in beta mining machine learning community on inspired by this foundation result and models to have more resistant uh, classifiers, more resistance machine learning models. So I will be talking about those. It will require a little bit knowledge of uh, SVMs. I'll try to mention it, uh, but again, as simple as possible. And then, I'm, of course, there is uh, such a rich literature of mach applying machine learning already for cybersecurity problems. And I've I chosen some of the papers to show uh, how some certain technique used, for example, later on attacked by the same community. So there was a paper who was saying, oh, we have a machine learning technique to detect this cyber attack. And then next year, in a, let's say CCS, there's another paper attacking that attack, another paper attacking that attacking, and so on. So what does this mean from, at least uh, from the 
foundational models and why some of those attacks may not be surprising. So that's the, uh, the uh, latest part. And then I will try to conclude uh, by uh, some uh, summary and suggestions that is based on uh, what I've seen on how to apply them more in practical sense like machine learning. So this will be the agenda. Uh, please uh, feel free to ask uh, questions anytime if something is not clear. Uh, I hope it won't be too boring. So if it's a little bit more interactive, I guess it will be more uh, fun. So that's the that's the goal. Uh, so let's let's start with some foundational results. And in the uh, machine learning community, this learning with noise have been uh, I think explored. 30, 40, 30, at least, I mean, many, many years ago. And, uh, and the idea was that how we can learn if we have errors in the data. Uh, this numbers, for when I, when I put the slides online, the numbers basically refer to the papers uh, at the end of the slides. Uh, here, uh, there was lots of uh, early development on something called PAC learning model, uh, which I won't go into detail pro 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 uh, in basically trying to understand what's learnable under polynomial time. And I think it was a Turing Award uh, winner a couple of years ago, this PAC learning model and the development of it uh, maybe two, three years ago. Uh, Valiant from Harvard uh, won the Turing Award uh, for that work in PAC learnability. So there was lots of early work in uh, 70s, 80s about what's learnable from finite samples. So as a side uh, note of that work, uh, there was some work about uh, what's learnable when you have errors in your data. And there is a precise characterization of uh, things that are learnable. And uh, so this early foundation results consider about this setting. The setting is that you have training data. Again, for those who are very familiar with the machine learning, we have a training data, we have some, we collect some data set. In this data set, let's say we have malware samples or a legitimate, uh, let's say, software. And we have labels. It says, okay, this, this binary sequence is malware. This binary sequence is, let's say, legitimate. So you have this training data set. But in this model, the adversary may manipulate some of those points in your data set. And especially, the adversary has unbounded resource. In other words, it can choose any strategy to lie. And the attacker knows, the adversary knows the target concept, the concept or the, the thing that the machine learning model tries to learn. That's in this terminology they call target concept. So this, the concept here is that what's the relationship between the data and the class value. Class value here, again, let's say malware or not so uh, legitimate software. And then, uh, and it knows everything basically in, in the thing, but we limit the adversary. In other words, adversary can generate uh, with probability uh, some parameter beta that it can generate malicious er errors. So here that the attacker or adversary can look at the training data, knows everything about what you try to learn, and try to come up with the worst possible noise or worst possible modifications to the data so that it will get the best uh, or the, uh, it will make the data mining model as, I mean, least effective as possible. So, in other words, its goal is to foil the learning algorithm. And now the question uh, these, this uh, paper long time look into was, what can you learn under this, this setting? So if, if an adversary can arbitrarily modify, change uh, uh, the training data, do we have hope to learn? Uh, this, uh, they look into the two different settings. So here the class C is basically what we try to learn, the concept we try to learn. 
And the concept, again, I mean the relationship between the data and the label, and that's something we want to learn. And then uh, this, this is basically representing a given, uh, given a concept, in other words, what we try to learn. This EMC represents the largest value of beta that can be tolerated by any learning algorithm for C. So this is kind of the upper bound. And here there is no basically uh, limitations in terms of uh, computational time. So the algorithm try to learn this concept uh, and take as long as possible. Now the question is if the attacker malicious the changes a subset uh, of the data, but we have a limit, this beta is a limit, what's the, uh, what's the best beta that we can tolerate to learn this concept? And the learning here is that I will describe a little bit more. We want to learn this accurately. In other words, you want to learn a machine learning model that can do predictions uh, somewhat accurately. Okay. The, the second thing they look into is uh, basically uh, the uh, more uh, polynomial time model. So here, basically, we want to limit our learning algorithm to a polynomial time algorithm. So polynomial time if you look at the theorems and so on, become important because if you are running polynomial time, you can only have polynomial many samples that you can go over in terms of the running time. Therefore, it has it puts a limitation, so you cannot want exponentially many samples, for example. So now, the the uh, here the the question is: What is the largest set of malicious error that can be tolerated by uh, this uh, polynomial time learning algorithm? For again concept C. C, just to re re remind again, is uh, the thing that we try to learn from the data, the concept, the relationship, let's say, between Twitter account behavior versus whether it's a sp spam account or a legitimate account. So that's, the, that's our concept, relationship between the tweets and the spam, spam or, and so on. So the first, uh, theorem uh, says that uh, there is definitely an, yes, sure, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, basically, uh, I mean, he, I, I will come, come back to this in the sense their, their bound is they show a specific learning technique achieving this polynomial time. So when we come to that theorem, it will show, I will, I mean, I will, I will show a theorem something like this, where I said, you know, you can learn in polynomial time with error rate this, and it will give us a lower bound. So in a sense, we will get a lower bound for this scenario, for this scenario. Okay, and then we will get an upper bound for the first case. So what's the upper bound on the first case? It says that uh, there are some concept classes C, where whatever the algorithm you have, uh, you cannot expect it to have uh, an uh, beta that would be uh, bigger than epsilon divided by one, one plus epsilon. And then you may ask, what's epsilon? <laughs> and epsilon here is basically, again, don't be scared. Hopefully, you will get the uh, uh, final good uh, summary of this. But epsilon is basically, in this setting, used as you try to learn, a, you try to get a model, and they call this model epsilon good if, if it's type one and type two errors are less than epsilon. False positive or false negatives is less than epsilon, means that this is an epsilon good hypothesis to learn this concept class C. So in this model, we, we, don't, we have unknown concept, which is, let's say, relationship between tweets and uh, whether a tweet is spam or legitimate. That's the concept we try to learn, but it may, we don't know what it is exactly. We learn, our algorithm learns something, and that's a hypothesis. And if hypo that hypothesis is good, uh, epsilon good, then it means that it's false positive and false negative both are less than epsilon, okay? So this says that there are some certain classes, and whatever you do, okay, those, for those classes, there is no algorithm that can 
uh, handle beta bigger than uh, epsilon divided by one plus epsilon. So in other words, if you want to achieve uh, error rate at most epsilon, beta must be less than epsilon divided by epsilon. How the proof works, again, I'm not doing any proof, but they kind of construct a specific class. And, and for that class, they show that information theoretically, et cetera, there's no such learning algorithm. And that will was an upper bound. Of course, what does upper bound means from practice is that uh, if the attacker can do an arbitrary change in the data that you are using to build a model, then you are, you don't, you, there is some limit, there should be some limit to attacker capabilities because otherwise you shouldn't be expecting to learn a uh, very good model. So in a sense, like if garbage is in, you will have those garbage out type of thing. But if the garbage is small enough, <laughs> then you could learn a good uh, result model. And this result, uh, interestingly, uh, is uh, for, uh, uh, holds even for algorithms with unbounded computation resources. And, uh, uh, it, and it holds regardless of the time. In other words, like running more will not help or having more sample will not help. So this is kind of upper bound on the malicious error rate. The second thing is that they come up with kind of a lower bound. And uh, the, again, this is the development is quite involved. They use chain of bounds, this and that. But let me try to at least give you the intuition of this lower bound. Again, let's assume that you have a concept class. In other words, like you have a problem where you, can, you have an algorithm A that can come up with a data mining model with a good accuracy. Again, remember the epsilon. But let's assume that model uh, model uses certain number of samples. In other words, in order to learn that, we need to have enough data points in our data set. And we assume that that number depends on, let's say, epsilon, uh, which is how good the result we want it to be. And it depends on this delta. And delta means in pack learning, and that's the, again Turing Award winning uh, formalization, it says that the algorithm A running after seeing uh, this approximately this many samples will output a good model with probability one minus delta. In other words, we assume that without any attacker involvement, we have a learning technique after seeing certain number of samples will output a good model with uh, high probability. If you have such a learning algorithm, what this result showed that, then assume, let's look at how many samples this algorithm needed for much less error, okay? And we are okay that half of the time we will be failing. So if our algorithm can run, but half of the time it may fail. If, if we get this uh, S, okay, and let whatever the number of S is, then the beta that we can do, remember the beta tolerance stuff, in other words, the malicious attacker can change the beta, uh, with probability beta, the, uh, the values the, in the training data set, that then we can withstand a beta something like this. So it's, it's relationship between the epsilon that we need in the modified algorithm and also the sample size. So this is a lower bound because they show that if you have a good method, okay, you will need more samples probably. And the better that you can withstand, in other words, the attacker's manipulation that you can stand uh, will be bounded by the, the lower error rate and this one. So this kind of shows that uh, roughly uh, the, if you have more and more data based on uh, this, you can still learn good results from the data. To summarize, again, I know a little bit math in it, but to summarize, uh, this error tolerance against data poisoning did not come at the expense of efficiency or simplicity, but you may need more data points. You may need more larger data set. Uh, then, uh, and the attacker capabilities are bounded based on the complexity. So what's inherent here is that 
this S is kind of related to how complex the concept you try to learn. Therefore, it has some relationship between the complexity of the concept you try to learn or the complexity of the uh, model that you try to build. Uh, I skipped the proofs, etc., but they were showing that in these results you can tolerate bet, uh, bet, uh, bet, I mean higher error rates uh, when you, you have uh, both uh, types of examples. In other words, like you have examples of a legitimate, let's say, Twitter account and a malicious Twitter account. So if you have a samples from both cases, this shows that you can withstand even higher error rates. So having both type of examples, good and bad, legitimate and spam, or let's say malware versus legitimate software, makes it easier to withstand against this kind of uh, poisoning attacks. And this, this has, I think, at least theoretically has interesting relationship between the learning with malicious errors and this data poisoning attacks. So therefore, summary, in summary, you could really learn, even if there's a data poisoning attack, as long as based on what you are learning, the poisoned instances are small. And I chose a paper when we do the, hopefully if you are still around, when we do the more application part, uh, we choose an example where they do data poisoning attacks and then we'll, you, you can see, for example, uh, that the, the accuracy doesn't fall too much if the poisoned sample is small, but then if it becomes something big, then you see it's, there is falling down. So we see an example of this theoretical result in action uh, when we cover another paper. Uh, this was very early work, uh, and then it was more on the on the uh, learning and theoretical issues when we are learning uh, uh, from the data and the attacker poisoning the data that we are trying to learn and build models. The other set of work, foundational work look into what happens is if the data is manipulated during the deployment or test time. Like in the spam detection example I was giving, uh, right? You change the email contents. You basically uh, add uh, uh, good words into your email or write Viagra in a different way. So when doing deployment, what happens if the instances are modified? And also, of course, intrusion detection. There are many examples of it. You can change. Uh, for example, uh, packet lengths, etc. There are some intrusion detection models out there looking to uh, network intrusion detections, the packet length, this and that. Their attacker may randomize it, may modify it. In the case of malware detection, of course, uh, you know, there is polymorphic malware that changes the binary. So f extracting signatures is by changing and becoming tougher. Uh, fraud detection, there is lots of uh, adaptation happen by the uh, fraudsters and so on. So, that, so now we are talking about a scenario where attacker tries to adapt uh, in the test time. Most of the models that, that we'll be considering will be looking at this from a game theory point of view. Uh, I, won't, I don't want to turn this into a game theory class, so I won't be going into any equilibrium discussions and so on. But for those who know game theory, we will be doing basic Nash equilibrium type scenario and leader follow with Sekalberg games. So what does this uh, game and game theory looks like is, again, a little bit of equations, but I'll try to explain the basics of that. So you have a training set and a test set in this setting. So uh, you have given a scenario where uh, you want to learn a data mining model from this training set, okay? And here uh, you try to have this classifier C and given X, it will try to predict the class failure. So for example, this classifier could be like, S could be the set of spam legitimate emails and we have some certain email set we want to test our models on. 
So we learn a classifier from S that will give an email, try to predict whether it's a spam or not. So now, here we are now bringing utility and uh, adaptation of the uh, attacker into the play. In other words, uh, how, you could, how the attacker uh, or the defender can measure the different features. So here we are assuming that uh, this each instance is a set of features. Uh, for example, whether a certain word is exist or whether the email is coming from a certain server, for example. These are all could be features. And you, you assume a, some kind of cost. And then most of the models and others have some kind of utility. In other words, what's the utility of classifying an instance as YC when it's actually Y? So in this example, I say positive and negative, you have two class only. And of course, you would assume that if you make, if something is negative and then, uh, and then you classify it as positive, you would lose some money because you make a mistake. And similarly, when something positive is negative, you would, the, the data mining, from data mining point of view, you are doing a classification error. In other words, you are misclassifying a legitimate email, let's say a spam and vice versa. Of course, if you are correct, your assumption is that uh, they are uh, basically, your, your, your utility is positive. So now we are kind of trying to, this is a, one of the early work, I think 2004 or something, try to now actively model this adaptation and this game between the data mining, machine learning model builder and the adversary. Of course, in order to do this game, you need to talk about utilities, and that's why this discussion come into play. I think most important uh, part of this is to modeling attackers' uh, adaptive behavior. So this is, I think, uh, maybe quite challenging from real point of view, but at least all these uh, foundational results says that if you want to be at least a uh, couple of steps ahead in the game, you need to understand how attacker can potentially manipulate the data. And for that reason, most of the models have something of this form, and we will see a couple of such model examples, uh, is that uh, you, have a, you, what is the, you have an instance X, positive means it's in this case controlled by the attacker, positive means it's a spam basic in this scenario, or a malware, or, you know, uh, intrusion, for example, and then the attacker may modify the instances under their control from something like X to X prime, okay? And that's the attacker's potential modification. And now the important thing is that what's the cost of changing the IT feature? For example, uh, we will see some examples later on, your model could be uh, classifying uh, network packets as intrusions or not, and one of your features could be the packet length, okay, average packet length for the connection. So now the question this theoretical model says is, from attacker point of view, how easy or costly for attacker to modify that feature that you are using? So that's the crucial, crucial uh, thing used in this stuff. So this kind of captures this, uh, this uh, change by the attacker. So in a, in a sense, you have this modeling scenario for the attacker. So you need to understand your attacker in a sense. Of course, uh, the attacker will win if, let's say, spam emails are classified as legitimate emails. So the attacker will uh, get utility when the classifier classifies something wrong, let's say. Therefore, attacker wants it to be classified wrong, you know, if it's positive and it's classified as negative. So in other words, if it's spam and if it's classified as uh, legitimate, then the attacker will win. But if it's spam and the classifier gets it, attacker doesn't get money. Uh, here, 
attacker doesn't care about the other scenarios. So attacker is worried about the fact that it's the things under its control is passing this data mining model and it's classified as legitimate, etc. And that's what uh, this part tries to capture. Um, this early work uh, by, uh, uh, I forget the names, uh, from University of Washington uh, long, uh, many, many years ago, uh, tried to uh, model uh, this as a one move by each player, okay? So you start with a data mining model, attacker learns it and so on, and they try to understand how this evolving happened. The big assumption in almost all of these foundational results is that uh, you, you, both sides know everything. So from a uh, game theoretic point of view, for those who know game theory, this is like a complete information game in a sense. Each side knows what, whatever happens. And the uh, early work looking to this very simple classifier called naive Bayes models. So here, uh, you, you estimate the probability distribution using this naive approximation, and you classify something as positive if the probability that uh, given x, the probability that it's positive, divided by given x, probability that it's negative, is bigger than this threshold based on the utility. And these probabilities are learned using basic naive, uh, naive based assumption. That's for those who have taken a machine learning class, like the first thing, I guess, everybody's teaching, uh, but from our point of view, it's not as important. But basically, we have, from data, we learn some model that gives, given x, the probability that it's positive or not, and that's using many different models. So, uh, adversaries, so the, in, in this scenario, like, the question becomes, what's the adversary's optimal strategy? Uh, again, as I, I want to emphasize that it has complete information, and uh, while devol developing adversaries' optimal strategy, they assume that classifier is unaware of its presence. And the adversary tried to modify features such that, and that's the important part, the transformation cost is less than the expected utility. In other words, attacker can arbitrarily change what, what's uh, the data we observed as long as it's profitable for the attacker. So in other words, we don't, what we have seen in the past will not be really has any relationship to the future uh, because attacker can modify it arbitrarily, but there is a limit. The limit is that attacker is rational and it will modify these instances based on this. Uh, if you recall, we assume that there is a kind of uh, weight there. This becomes uh, solving an integer linear program, which is quite tough, tough to do it for finding optimal solution. And uh, in other words, like given a classifier, what's the optimal modification? You need to solve a very complex optimization. And similarly, uh, if you look at the classifier, uh, you need to come up with an adversarial uh, scenario. Uh, here, the assumption is that uh, adversary uses an optimal strategy for a given classifier and therefore the initial training data is actually not tempered in this scenario and this transformation cost uh, is a semi-metric. Now what the, the, what the classifier is doing is, is, is this, uh, basically it, given x it predicts as yc but the important thing is that the here, uh, you, instead of using traditional probability, it uses a different probability distribution. And this probability distribution becomes something like uh, this, given a, something, assume that something is uh, spam, let's say, what is the probability that I see, I, I see a X prime? And this will depend on what was the probability that I would see X prime X some certain x against the domain, and that x is converted to x prime. So in other words, when, I'm trying, when you try to measure uh, the probability of something, you need to figure out the fact that 
this may not be really x prime. It may be x original, but it may be turned to x prime. So that's this uh, probability happening. And this involves, again, solving some uh, linear pro integer linear programming uh, things combined with uh, some other linear program stuff. I think uh, if you combine optimally, it will become NPR somewhere. So it's quite complex, but I think the, from more practical point of view, what this foundation says that you should start, in order to be one step ahead, you should start modeling the attacker capabilities. Um, after that work, there were uh, different type of game theoretical models applied to this scenario. Uh, this is uh, one model. Uh, here it is slightly different in the in the setting. Uh, here, <coughs> uh, you have an adversary and the adversary chooses an action, let's say whatever that action is, modifying the data. And the data miner observes this action and chooses another uh, classifier based on it. And the game ends with this. So this is a very basic model. But this model, so it's not very realistic maybe, but it has interesting implications for choosing features for data mining and which uh, in adversarial data mining. So it looks uh, a little bit unrealistic, but it, bear with me, it will have some uh, it would have some kind of uh, real, real impact results, at least intuitions, after all this math. Uh, here, uh, it's assumed that this is, a, this is called uh, standard mixture models, so you have good class, bad class. Again, most of this foundation work assume you have two things, like legitimate mails, spam, malware versus regular software, intrusion, non-intrusion. So it's usually have two classes. So this is a, a basically a mixture model. In other words, you assume that data that you are seeing is a vector. Again, these are features that you are using in your model. It could be, uh, again, like the packet land, you know, uh, for example, uh, or pack some packet frequencies. Let's say you do n-gram models. Or it could be in malware, like the function calls and you know, uh, certain API calls, and then you can use the API calls as features, etc. So these are arbitrary features. Now, here, the assumption is, again, the attacker can modify the bad class. So this is, these are basically probability uh, density functions, and the attacker can arbitrarily change the distributions. Uh, once you write this, uh, you can start writing optimal solutions to this. Again, I know it's getting boring around 3 p.m., but uh, just to summarize, what will happen is that if you can r start writing uh, those equations, you can start saying that given attacker strategy space, I will define what is this, you can always find the best uh, classifier and this classifier will be uh, will have uh, will have this uh, uh, error basically. Uh, okay, so the classifier will be defined uh, given the attacker's options and this distributions, and then you can define the utility. Here, this utility involves again cost of classifying uh, some instance. Uh, let's say legitimate as illegitimate or uh, spam as legitimate and so on. Okay, and the data miner, of course, given the attacker's thing, tries to minimize the uh, minimize its cost. Uh, now, the big assumptions again here in this model is uh, changing a feature or mod modeling instance has a cost to adversary. This is, again, very crucial things in all these uh, adversarial data mining models, is that there must be a cost to adversary in adaptive behavior. If there is no cost, these theoretical models show that attacker can always defeat any machine learning technique. And if there is no cost, basically, uh, to change the instances, it can always find a legitimate 
class and copy it. For example, uh, if you just do the content, uh, if you do like say tweet based spam analysis, and if your classifier looks only in the content of the Twitter account, as an attacker, I can always choose a legitimate Twitter account, let's say President Obama, and I can copy everything on that, right? Of course, you need to have additional features that I cannot copy, like, for example, IP addresses. You know, if it's not coming from Washington, D.C. versus Russia, you may know that one account is not legitimate. So in other words, this says that if the features that you are measuring for your model can be arbitrarily manipulatable by the attacker without any cost to attacker, then you have no hope. Okay? It's very trivial in a sense, but uh, that's the reason it's very important to understand which features has cost and so on. Okay? And then once you do it, you can write the attacker's utility. Once you write the attacker's utility, this becomes a, something called uh, a Sekalberg game. And this is also called leader follower games. And Sekalberg games have interesting, uh, actually, applications in Homeland Security. Uh, Milan uh, Tambe uh, and uh, his colleagues, uh, I think he was at USC, uh, his colleagues applied this to this kind of games for airport security, like how to, uh, op how to optimize for uh, random checks at the airport. They have lots of models that use this game theoretical Sekalberg game. So it's really a workhorse for many different areas. So you can, this was one of the early work that applied this to, uh, uh, to this problem. And uh, you can solve for equilibrium and you can figure out what will happen given uh, uh, attacker's transformation of the instances, your response and how you could choose the best classifier. Of need needless to say that this is very complex and you cannot solve it for arbitrary scenarios. If you know the distributions, you can solve for it. Uh, this paper has, actually, it's, I'm co-author of this one, has uh, like eight pages of equations in one derivation, uh, so, which I didn't do it, Bowie did it, so uh, that, don't ask me if you read that. But uh, basically, what's the intuition behind all this, I will skip this, what is that this kind of uh, ex bring, like how to choose attributes for adversarial learning, okay? And the intuition for this word was, okay, go with the most predictive attribute, right? This is the traditional, what you do in data mining, like you use information gain and other measures to choose the most predictive attribute. But as the attacker adapt, the most predictive attribute may not be the good one. And of course you can remember, I'm, I keep mentioning like it's maybe, it must be hard for attacker to change the, the feature that you are using. Otherwise, attacker can arbitrarily modify it. So you can say, oh, well, choose the hardest feature to change. So this model can indicate that uh, really you need a different way of thinking. And here I'll just give a very basic example of what this, all this theory tried to imply was assume you have three features or attributes called, let's call them X1, X2, X3 and you want to choose one feature for building a model. This means that this feature distributed like normal with mean one and uh, standard deviation one and the, for uh, good class and bad class it has mean four and uh, uh, variance one. So this means one, one and 3.5. Uh, for those who can imagine distributions this, if you look at this feature, these two classes, good and bad, are most separate because their means are different, okay? So, you, so by looking at which feature is very predictive without any adversarial thinking, okay, this would be the best feature because this is the best separating these two classes, good and bad, okay? If you look at from attacker point of view, what is the hardest to modify? What is the hardest to change? And, uh, you know, uh, basically uh, to, to uh, change by the attacker, 
you would see that the first one is more uh, first one is better because it has higher penalty for attacker. But then you start looking at the adaptation, you realize that really you need to have this is the very equilibrium behavior coming to play. This has the lowest error actually. So you, you have this, the second feature is not as predictive as the third one, or it's not as hard for attacker to change like the first one, but it's a, a really a good combination of both. So therefore, uh, these models, uh, of course, you, you need, I mean, uh, 30 pages to write, uh, come on this conclusion, but it says that you really need to combine uh, a predictive features that are also hard to change, and you need to really balance this too. Uh, so anyway, uh, there is, uh, so there, in the previous game, uh, the leader was the uh, leader and the uh, leader was the attacker. So there was some criticism of that, saying that why we are being uh, reactive? Why don't we become proactive in terms of building our models? So there were some work, uh, this is by Bergner et al, on changing it. Here, uh, the data miner is the leader, or machine learning builder is the lead leader, and the attacker is the follower. And they try to solve the Stackelberg game in this scenario. So in other words, how we could uh, do the Stackelberg game in this setting. Again, I'll skip, uh, I think, uh, as more people are leaving, <laughs> I'll start skipping more equations, I guess. Uh, that's a cue for me <laughs> to not to go over all those equations. Uh, no, if no one's left, that's fine too. But anyway, uh, so they tried to come up with a slightly different modeling in terms of utilities. Just uh, basically, at least to give the intuition is that now again here you have leader, learner, and an adversary, and it has some utility functions. Again, this is in the foundation results. You have always this utility functions happening. Like, uh, and there are the game theory come into play. Important thing in this one is that they do something like uh, SVM, support vector machine type of scenario. And the cost has, uh, from the data mining point of view, has this W, which is the, the linear boundary that you try to learn. And there is some kind of regularization factor here, to punishing the learner to have a complex model. And that's this part. From the attacker point of view, attacker can do arbitrary change to the data set. That's the D dot. And it has also costs associated with D and D dot. So in other words, moving D to D dot, what's the cost? Again, as you see, all, again, almost all the models have some sort of penalty for modification. Now you have another game. Now the leader decides the uh, W. In other words, leader says uh, what's the uh, W that we are learning, uh, which is the linear vector. So the, here the classifier will be Wx bigger than some threshold. Based on that, you will classify. An adversary now observes this and changes the data distribution based on this observed scenario under the utility function. So unlike the previous model, in this model, the, lead, the, the data miner starts first, publishes the data mining model. Now the attacker tries to adapt to this model by changing the data that's been, that it will be classified. So uh, the adversary basically tries to minimize its optim optimization. In other words, given the data mining model, again, this is basically a hyperplane. Uh, what's the, the minimum cost modification for me based on my utility function? Of course, from the leader point of view, to find the optimal W, you need to think one step ahead, right? Because if basically, I'll just skip it, but basically you need to solve an optimization problem where you say that, okay, I want to choose W that 
that minimax this utility I have for W, but I know that if I choose W, the attacker will try to find the minimum cost modification uh, to its data. So I need to solve this two-level optimization uh, to find the best W. Again, here you get the Stekelberg game and you can do Stekelberg equation. An interesting thing here is that, at least for when you have game theory, unless the adversary's cost is changed, or in other words, like if it's becoming cheaper or easier for attacker to manipulate that feature, or unless the, uh, the learner's cost changes, in other words, building a mining model somehow gets cheaper and so on, this shows that this will be the best you can do for this learning problem. So this equilibrium behavior kind of predicts the future. What I've skipped is that it's basically uh, you try to learn these costs and uh, then they do some experiments to show how, what this model le can learn, but again, it's a linear classifier. Uh, so, there were other foundational work as well, but I just chose a three different flavor of, or four, I would say, flavor, like foundational results in terms of uh, poisoning the data from the data that you are learning and the data that you are seeing uh, during classification and what are the implications. Uh, later work, uh, these are all appeared in machine learning, data mining venues, all these uh, papers. Later work, try to get these, I would say, foundational results and try to make it, change it, these insights from foundational results and try to modify the existing machine learning techniques with those insights. So what's the main insight, I would say, is that you need to start modeling attacker capabilities and you need to start modeling the attacker so that you could uh, be more resistant to potential attacker manipulation down the road, okay? So again, coming to our early example is how, this is one of the uh, work, so how can we, for example, have a support vector machine, which is a workhorse of machine learning models, and what support vector uh, machine learning tries to do is that you, you, tr you have a set of data points, okay, and you try to find a hyperplane, this is in two dimension, that, separate, that has this, uh, this mar highest margin. In other words, you find this plane that has the highest separation margin, okay? So that's support vector, and in order to do that, you need to solve an optimization problem, and there are many SVM models that you, you, you can use. So now, the, one of the uh, work in applying this foundation results to coming up with new machine learning models use support vector machines because you can modify its optimization with the attacker capabilities in mind. Again, now you know attacker capabilities, now you want to maybe modify this uh, results. So how does it work? Uh, Again, there are some equations, but I'll try to just give the intuition. In this work, uh, they think what the attacker can do and try to put it into the optimization of SVM is solving. So there are two types of attacks that attacker may be doing uh, for the test time. One is assuming that the attacker can change the features, delta I, delta J, based on some parameters. Here, this small CF and the capital CF determines how much an attacker can modify any given feature. Again, you start seeing that in the data mining model, you try to model attacker capabilities. In the other, they call it targeted attack, actually we call it targeted, I, I was a quarter of this one, uh, targeted attack where you know a good sample. In other words, you have a target, let's say, tweet account, and you try to get closer to it, but you have some limitations in you know, how much you can change your instance to get closer to your target. And that's, again, some uh, math things there, not so important. 
So what you do is that once you have uh, this kind of adversarial modeling, you modify a traditional, uh, let's say, SVM. Traditional SVM part will be usually composed of something like this part is different though, but this, this is the, where the traditional SVM will, will, will happen. So, I mean, forget about all starting from here, this part assume it's not there. This would be the traditional SVM traditional support vector machine. What the traditional support vector machine is, so basically I'm saying, I don't know if it's clear, clear, I should have put it there maybe. Forget the bottom part here and just focus on the top part. That's the traditional SVM is trying to solve. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so I have a question. Sure. Yeah. Uh, that I, I mean, I, if it's if it's just one, you know, like then you can just mo change the class; okay. it doesn't change. But if it's both at the same time, I don't think most things model that, but it can be modified to model. I think so. I, in some cases, it will be a trivial extension, but in some models, I don't think it will be trivial because it's quite complex to solve the equations. So usually that the, the assumption is that you have a malicious, uh, you know, like you want to make your spam email to be classified as mail. The second thing is that why most papers don't assume that is they assume that the attacker can, doesn't control the legitimate emails. For example, I, the legitimate email that I'm sending to is not controlled by the attacker. I write that email, so he doesn't control it. He only controls the spam space. Of course, if he chooses to write a real email, you know, I don't know what that means, but yeah, I don't think, not that many papers look into that. See, what, what I'm saying is now people are getting all these legitimate email data sets from the internet, mm -hmm. right? So the attacker can poison those by inserting the, the spam words into the legitimate email. That's in the poisoning center. This is for in the testing case, uh, not the model learning case, but more in the testing scenario. But that's, I think, an interesting point uh, to look into. Uh, so uh, all I was trying to say here in this slide is that uh, this is a very uh, similar to standard SVM. So if you are doing like an SVM, as I mentioned, you would be solving this optimization without these button parts. So basically what you are trying to find a, a separating thing that has the C value here, which is basically uh, trying to do this, uh, minimize this uh, function here. And C tries to, uh, is added here for the slack variables. And the slack variables is that sometimes you cannot separate nicely like this. And here, the traditional SVM tries to, uh, optimize, I mean, tries to uh, give a room for that. And this is the traditional SVM is solving. Now, once you have this attacker things, in other words, once you know that attacker can modify the features that you've seen in the data during test time, you add, you add more constraints here, automatically uh, modeling the attacker's behavior, okay? So you could do such equations uh, for the targeted scenario. Again, you can change the SPM. So what does this try to do really? Okay, let me try to at least capture from a small, simple example is that uh, this is a very basic scenario. Here uh, you have just a hypothetical case where you have uh, two uh, features in your model. And then the, these, these are basically uh, positive examples, the pluses and the negative ones are uh, green ones. And if you do a traditional data mining, positive ones are the bad, bad class. The traditional SVM will choose this as the boundary, okay? Because it separates these two classes, okay? But this, 
but attacker can potentially manipulate what you have seen, right? So that that's would be the uh, attacker manipulation during deployment. What this blue line, which is this adversarial SVM, tries to do is tries to to basically uh, in advance uh, give some kind of slack for uh, the adversarial real behavior, but not too much. In other words, if you try to move past this blue line too far away, then you are making lots of errors on the other side. Maybe you will always figure out a spam email correctly, but you will be classifying many legitimate emails as spam. So this optimization, the complex optimization, try to really balance between the attacker's potential modification and movement through the boundary, but not too much. And where this comes into play, this comes into play all in these parameters. In other words, we are assuming that for each feature, we know how much attacker can modify. Based on that, we try then this optimization problem solving here, tries to find a boundary that balances between having uh, errors where you classify negative instances more positive between the attacker's manipulation. So, and uh, I don't have results here, but you can show that, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so now the question is, how does that boundary could be done? It become, becomes on attacker capabilities. So if the attacker is very, very uh, powerful and can change anything arbitrarily, of course, you have no hope, as we mentioned. Now, if it's very strong or powerful, then you may want to be more conservative on, on this side. And again, it depends on this balance that you try to solve here. So what does this uh, model says is basically you, you try to, uh, to have an optimization model to build your data mining uh, where constraints are tied to adversarial attack models. You don't exactly know what the attack here. I just want to emphasize that. You need to somewhat estimate the attacker's capabilities in changing the features. So you don't know what exactly the attacker may change or adapt, but you know uh, you model its behavior, okay? And you can show that, of course, once you build a model, uh, empirically at least, show that this is more resistant than other SVM models. And uh, for those, it will be a little bit uh, technical, but uh, for those who know one class SVM, this is better than one class SVM that just uses, let's say, the good data points or the negative instances as well. So this uh, using the attack points help also. Uh, so this was here uh, in this scenario, we were at, we assumed that attack, we have, we always observe the features, uh, but the attacker can always, can uh, basically uh, manipulate those features. So in this SVM model, uh, the attacker was manipulating features by adding this delta, J, delta ij, it could be positive, negative, but it was manipulating the features. Now, uh, there were other work that look into what happens uh, if there is a missing or corrupted feature. So in other words, attacker, because of attacker manipulation, not all the features are available uh, at test time to differentiate good versus bad. Again, like in most scenarios, initially it has uh, instances drawn from IID. This is you know, class value and this is X. Again, this is linear margin-based classifiers thing of SVM. And then again here, the assumption is that you have clean, uncorrupted training data to learn initial classifier. Remember, as I mentioned, classifier is basically a, a WX uh, is bigger than or equal to B. So it's a linear classifier. So basically you have this training data and the training data have all the features. And for all the features, you, you learn this uh, classifier, which are W1 to well, the, the N or N, and you have this uh, B value where you're thresholding. And the test data has now 
at each time have missing, potentially missing features. And now attacker can hide certain features when uh, you are trying to do classification. So now this is a slightly different model. Again, we are trying to model the attacker capability directly in our machine learning thing. And here the attacker uh, tries to uh, uh, basically uh, do this uh, type of uh, uh, choosing which subsets. Again, uh, this becomes uh, uh, the standard results apply here. If the adversary is all powerful, you can, of course, delete all the features in, during test time and you are, you, it will be useless, okay? And again, there is an assumption that each feature has some certain values. Again, you see in this work as well, some kind of modeling of attacker capabilities and uh, uh, certain valuations. And here, for example, and limitation of the attacker. Here, the limitation is that adversary must leave a certain subset which has certain value you intact. In other words, uh, it, 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 has to, uh, it has to basically, uh, oops, okay. Uh-oh. Sorry. Uh, it has to leave some sort of subset of features intact, but it can choose which features to delete before the testing. So again, uh, as more people are leaving, I'm skipping more equations. Uh, yes. I'm sorry, isn't that feature? Correct. That's the reason, theoretically, the attacker can randomize. That's the reason we have done something like this. So here, theoretically, it can choose one, two, three, five. Then the next one can choose three, four. So it can randomize in this model. So again, <laughs> in order to skip more equations, uh, basically what they've shown is that you can write this as a, you can write this as a, a optimization problem, and you can have an algorithm that show, solves this optimization problem to come up with a learning method that's uh, resistant to those kind of attacks. Again, the intuition is model the attacker capabilities. Don't know exactly the attack, but the capabilities and learn a, uh, the classifier that is being resistant to that capability. Again, we don't know the attack, but just the capability. There were a few other things done uh, on this uh, work, especially inspired by spam filtering. Again, this is all machine learning. In the second half, I would be having more CCS type of papers, so that will be covered, so don't leave for the second half. <laughs> <coughs> so you, you've done the most boring half, okay? So I promise the second half is more fun. Uh, so uh, there were, as I mentioned, like good word attacks uh, where you have uh, things. And this work tries to look at a slightly different model. Here, uh, I, I will again skip this, but they try to do this uh, reverse engineering scenario. In other words, you have a class, remember the previous scenario, right? The previous scenario, the attacker always tried to change the instances so that uh, it will pass the classifier. This work tried to figure out how hard it is for attacker if there's a black box classifier to figure out in the previous work always the attacker knows the entire classifiers entire machine learning models here in this setting the attacker doesn't know the classifier you are using it's hidden and it's trying to figure out an instance that will pass the classifier in other words it tries to figure out a spam email that will pass the spam filter. It doesn't know the spam filter rules, it doesn't know the weights, unlike the previous work. Now it tries to change the uh, email, for example, by adding good words, such as, you know, uh, good words from legitimate emails or most frequent English words, let's say, so that it can pass the thing. And this ECRA learning, they call it adversarial classifier reverse engineering, they try to really find the, uh, they try to find 
uh, an instance, again, there is this cost function A here, that will be, that's actually a bad instance, or let's say spam, that will be classified as uh, basically non-spam. And, and the assumption here is that you have one positive and one negative instances classified by this classifier. And the attacker now can probe this classifier, can probe this machine learning model, okay? So it can run queries and then it can figure out whether the, this is uh, classified as spam or legitimate, etc. cetera, by, uh, by this. Interesting result this shows is that, uh, it, of course, linear models are quite easily reverse engineerable. Uh, basically, uh, they call it one plus epsilon learnable. In other words, you, you, you can, uh, here the one K comes into fact that you don't always want to minimize. You are okay if it is less than the K times the minimal cost. So if, the, if you have linear models uh, for as a classifier like SVM and so on, for attacker point of view, it needs to just do polynomial time queries and it can find an instance that will pass the classifier uh, quite uh, accurately. So that's uh, this work saying that also you can easily reverse engineer the classifier even if you don't know it under certain scenarios. In some cases they prove that, again I don't have it here, they prove that it's MP hard to, uh, to do uh, such uh, reverse engineering attacks. Um, I will not start, maybe uh, uh, I, would, I would stop here for this part and answer any questions. I don't want to uh, go to other one, maybe after more coffee, I will <laughs> continue. Are there any questions? To summarize this half is basically there are so many uh, modeling techniques and they are around on modeling adversarial capabilities and bringing a little bit of game theory. Is there any question? Yeah. yeah. Sure, go ahead, please. Thanks. <laughs> um, Make it more hard for attacks to have more features. So if you have a limited amount of features, the cost of changing uh, one of those features uh, of that's so the, I think the question is that so why don't we ha add more and more features yeah. so it will be harder for attackers to adapt yeah. the, the issue comes is that if you have they, they call it curse of dimensionality uh, in machine learning literature so if you have a higher dimensional feature space then learning requires more and more samples so therefore there is from forget about a reseller scenario there is all this uh, feature selection done in traditional machine learning data mining because when you have high dimensional feature space, you have this curse of dimensionality. Therefore, you try to use dimensions. So in many machine learning, take, start, take, uh, first thing you do is to do like some kind of feature selection then dimension reduction so that you cannot have arbitrarily many dimensions. Does yeah, it answer your question? Solutions, yeah, the approaches to uh, uh, the curse of dimensionality. Doesn't, can't you use those approaches to attack the problem of um, um, adversarial or um, uh, Maybe, I don't think there is, a, I'm not aware of any work that tries to combine dimension reduction, uh, curse of dimensional type of things with adversarial learning. I'm not aware of that. No. Yeah, please. I think there was a question ahead of me before I came up to the mic. You had your hand up. Okay. okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm working somewhat in this space for my dissertation, and one of the things I'm surprised I didn't hear you talk about was the scarcity problem when it comes to attacks, which is something that we've struggled greatly with. The idea that ultimately your, your, the feature set you're exploring to try to do prediction of attacks is gonna be very, very, very imbalanced. So when we've tried to apply this to some real problems, that's one of the biggest issues we've run into. So could you, you mean talk that, about that? Uh, so that problem, I, I think you're referring to class imbalance problem? Yes. That problem itself uh, has been uh, addressed in other machine learning domains. That's the reason I try to focus on what's new in the adversarial setting. In other words, the problem that you have few samples in one class 
happens, for example, in HIV prediction as well. So you have many, many more people who are uh, non-HIV versus HIV in your data set. Yes. And there's lots of research done, like I you can give an entire tutorial on how to deal with class imbalance problem. So there, of course, this area is rich. I, I mean, even three hour is too short, I guess, but like it's three hour, okay, don't be afraid. Uh, I mean, I, I didn't choose that area, but that's, okay. that's been an issue irrespective of at the resale setting. It's like a problem in other domains in machine learning as well. Sure, we can talk about it more often. Yeah, sure, of course, I would love to. Any other question before we go to break? Okay, yeah, go. Yeah, I will make everything available uh, online after today, I, yeah. And with the citations are there at least, we, we sampled 15 papers or so. Thanks. Uh, hopefully, you will come back after <laughs> break. <laughs> I will be here at least. <laughs>
they look into many features such as you know, whether it has JavaScript in it, it has embedded something, malformed object, some sort of malicious patterns. Also, even if everything is encrypted apparently in PDF, encryption is done uh, in the, if you think about the tree, on the certain nodes of the tree. Therefore, you can still look into the, uh, the encrypted part and uh, still learn something. So what this work is, uh, was doing is that uh, they do this uh, statistic, statistic analysis on the features uh, from the document structure and metadata. And they claim that uh, in this work, they, uh, they claim that this works quite well, even the, some parts are encrypted because of you can still get the structure and interesting metadata information, especially from normal documents. And then what they do is that they build classifiers. The classifiers are random forests and other work. And they have actually dual level classifier. One level gives a PDF input. And then it says, it tries to differentiate benign versus malicious. And in malicious, they do two different malicious types. The one call it opportunistic uh, and the other one's target. Uh, so they have, they divide the uh, PDF malware based on the capabilities. It's not as important what the details are but they have this two level classifier. And when they look at this uh, classifier, they throw in uh, basic uh, techniques, uh, such as uh, naive Bayes model I mentioned, the support vector machines, you saw it, at least uh, even the optimization in the last part. And then they have also random force. By the way, random force is uh, such a workhorse in any mo anything, the first machine learning technique I think you should throw in is random forest, you know, try with random forest and then that will be your baseline <laughs> and then try improve on it, on it and almost in many cases I've seen random forests do quite well. Of course deep learning etc beats it uh, in other set settings but you know it's a good initial baseline you everybody throws in. And here, actually, it turns out to be the best model. It has very little error. And they can train this malware detection software in like 92 seconds, you know, and classification is less than a second, basically. And then uh, this is their classifying target. Remember, uh, some people were asking about, uh, you know, class imbalance. I don't know where, where is he? Maybe he left. Oh, you're here still. Here, for example, they, if you think about it, Although some target malware part is little, but 5,000 benign, 5,000 uh, basically malware. So it's a very balanced, for example, in this setting. And then they have 100,000 testing uh, for uh, testing operational ones. So this is an, like an example showing that look, machine learning techniques can come up with a super duper classifiers where we can very accurately, the error rate is like 0 0.99 something, uh, can detect. So now again, remember the, all this foundation results say that like think one step ahead. So how the attacker can change, how the attacker can modify. So the follow-up, uh, sorry, uh, before coming to that. So this is their uh, accuracy results, false positive, false negative. Uh, sorry, uh, basically here they are showing that, uh, you know, if you do like only a uh, false positive rate of uh, 0 0.02, you can get closer to 0 0.99 accuracy. So the, it turns, turns out that uh, uh, malicious versus benign is very, very uh, accurate, you can distinguish them very quickly for distinguishing between opportunistic versus targeted. If you recall, it has two layers, distinguishing benign versus malicious and malicious, they try to distinguish these two type, type malicious. It's not as good, but still uh, they have uh, not good accuracy here as well. Above, it's not like 999 something, but it's above 90% and so on accuracy. So again, this is kind of showing that, look, machine learning techniques can work very well and you cannot human, a human cannot look every PDF document, but in a second, 
uh, we can come up with a good, you know, accurate result about whether this PDF document is malware or not. So, of course, again, not thinking next step how the attacker may adapt, uh, have a paper <laughs> out of it. So basically, in this work, they look at the previous one and try to figure out how you can attack this machine learning model. Of course, as we know, the attacking will happen based on changing features. Now the question is in PDF domain, which features you can change. So they really investigate this previous work uh, and the random first one, why? Because it's the best one, right? It has accuracy of, well, what does it like, 90, 0.99 uh, accuracy. And here the attacker now modifies the PDF file. In a sense, it changes the features used by the random forest. And then, of course, if the attacker can change, and this is why it's, uh, it may be harder, the attacker can arbitrarily create a PDF file, right? It can add dummy content in it. It can add few pieces where it may look legitimate. So what they've uh, what they look into is that uh, they have like original PDFs, let's say there is this uh, injected content. Uh, and it turns out that PDF, re they also use some facts about PDF inside knowledge. For example, PDF readers jump from trailer to direct to cross reference table, skipping injected content, content completely. In other words, it won't look like, uh, it won't be a corrupted thing, so you can make it a real PDF kind of document. So what, why this is important, this is kind of showing that if you don't consider attacker adaptation, attackers may come up with all these features and things, and they look into two types of attack. One is called mimicry attack. So they try to uh, transform a malicious sample so that it, it mimics a cho chosen benign sample as much as possible. Uh, so basically, you know, a good PDF file. Here, the assumption is that, uh, which I, I skipped, attacker knows which features of a PDF is uh, used to detect. And of course, this is not surprising. I think there was a paper yesterday, right? So you can read, the, uh, the attacker can read the paper, know which features are used in that paper and which features are used in the machine that model. So attacker know that. They also, these, uh, there, were, there were some other attacks based on uh, certain techniques. So if you know a technique like SVM, maybe you can choose more specific attacks uh, in modifying things. And this is more applicable for SVM and so on. So they have another set of attack for uh, another set of attack against uh, these specific things. So I will, I will just jump to the results. Uh, these results uh, look into different scenarios. Uh, one scenario is that it knows the feature set. In other words, it know, attacker knows which features are used uh, for the data mining. And then uh, they have a few other scenarios where attacker may know feature set and the classifier used and try to use the classifier features for attacking. And then uh, they have a combination of features training set, features training set, and, and so on. And then this is the score that the random forest or the, the, the classifier is giving. Uh, uh, before the attack happens, all, all the scenarios and the, the files that try has close to 100% score, which means that it says uh, malware score is 100, so it's the highest score level. So before the attack happens, the classifier, before the file is modified, classifier ca can classify with uh, almost close to 100%. Okay? Uh, now what will happen is that if, if you set the threshold as 50%. In other words, if something is higher than 50, you say that file is a malware or potential malware. What they show is that uh, except for this, uh, this scenario for mimicry with F, remember GDKD is for sp against specific uh, SVM type models. What they're saying is that 
if the threshold is 50%, if you go below 50%, then you will be classifying many legitimate PDFs as malware. In that scenario, 75% attacks would be classified as benign. So by changing the PDF, which was initially thought to be classified 100% accurately by this machine learning based technique, they managed to uh, make 75% of the attack points to be classified as benign, even with a conservative threshold of 50%. Okay, so this was this is an example of how uh, a classifier build on easy to modify features. Okay, in this scenario, why, why it's easy to modify? If you look at the papers, this PDF thing looks like you know the whether it, uh, it exists certain section or whether the length of the certain uh, pattern, for example. So it has features about PDF document where in this scenario, attacker can really successfully manipulate. Of course, there's a limit in the attacker scenario because still attacker needs to inject this malicious code in it somewhere. So that's the reason it cannot arbitrarily change everything, but it can change most of the things. And when, it's, when it can do, it has a good success uh, ratio. So this is not surprising because all this theoretical stuff, uh, as we were discussing before, was saying that if, if the, most of the features are easier to change, then attacker becomes more successful in evading the classifier. So this is, I think, one of the early work that kind of empirically uh, showed that intuition. There are, of course, some other probable other work as well, but I, I find it interesting to show uh, this uh, tra trade-off. Of course, there were, what can you do? Again, in this work, they suggest, you know, well, uh, why don't we uh, do, they call it vaccination defense, uh, modify a fraction of malicious sample in the training data set in such a way that they are more similar to expected attack samples. So there is solution in a sense. Uh, remember the previous part, the solutions we were looking into try to model the attacker capabilities in the learning phase, right? So they are saying that maybe if you don't want to use sophisticated model like that, just add few instances modified based on the expected attack and build your models based on, based on that, okay? Of course, this is only effective against uh, correct anticipated attacks. So I think from practical, at least I promised some practical uh, intuitions, I would say, uh, this shows that anything is modifiable uh, is quite easily deceived. Of course, if you think about PDF malware, if a malware tries to download some document, for example, if you can model that, it's very hard for attacker to change that behavior. And it's very hard to uh, sidestep that. Uh, this, that was an attack for, uh, the, I mean, like PDF malware detection and an attack for that. And then there was some work, uh, remember initially we talked about foundation part on learning with noise. Uh, there was some work on trying to uh, poison the learning scenario and, and see the impact of it. Uh, they, are, they, are, uh, they are doing it for crowdsourcing example. Uh, it was, I think, for using security a couple of years ago, this one. Uh, the previous one was, I think, also using security. Uh, anyway, the citations are there. Uh, so basically what, what this work doing is that they look at this uh, Sina Weibo, I think I'm, I'm not sure whether I pronounced correctly. And then, uh, and then look at this microblogging network. And from this network, they extracted profiles. Uh, these craft turfing ones are the, you can think of them as the malicious class or the bad class. And they have authenticated users. These are known to be good classes. So this is known to be bad. This is known to be good. And then these are uh, active users. They don't know whether exactly they are good or not, but they are more likely to be good because they have at least 50 followers and some certain number of tweets. Uh, my understanding is that in Weibo you have something like Twitter and you tweet. So uh, they try to use this data set to classify, uh, 
classify uh, accounts and they, they use again the uh, standard machine learning techniques like SVM, Bayesian, uh, Bayesian learning, like naive Bayes usually, decision tree. Uh, decision tree is basically uh, also very important, but random force is an ensemble of decision trees and usually random force are more stable. The decision trees itself has sometimes high variance, but they use that too. So this is the uh, data set uh, they, they used in this work. So this data set had, uh, you know, these number of uh, accounts and these are the tweet numbers and the comments. And then in this work, they extract features about like tweet contents, how long the account was there. So there is a lot of uh, features extracted based on the knowledge of the problem. Again, I, I skipped those details uh, again from this discussion is not as important. So here is uh, the, how it looks like, uh, the results. Uh, so the data set they tried to learn was uh, they have this 28K bad accounts and 28K randomly sampled authenticated users. And now they use that, so authenticated plus turfing means that you have, they have an equal mixture of bad and known good together to build stuff to predict the accounts. And then they have, uh, they have something called active and turfing. So randomly sampled active users. Again, some of the active users may be malicious, uh, but not, not, all, not, I mean, not all of them. They are more likely to be active and these are known turfing accounts. So here is their uh, false positive, false negative. RF is, is random force, J48 is a, a, a basic decision tree classifier. Uh, it's, in, uh, it's been implemented in many uh, things like uh, uh, many machine learning libraries. SVM, our SVM has uh, very different, uh, for those who use SVM, it has different kernel bases. You can use radial bases, radial function as a kernel or you can use a polynomial kernel. So these SVMs are basically SVMs with different settings. For those who doesn't know, it's not as important. And then th there is this Bayesian belief network, uh, which is an extended form of uh, Bayesian learning, if, if you think. Naive Bayes, as I mentioned, is very, usually very naive and it's, it doesn't work very well. So as you see, when you have, uh, when you have authentic good accounts combined with bad accounts, turfing accounts, uh, you have uh, classification as false positive, false negative quite uh, low. Again, this is a very balanced sample. Naive Bayes doesn't work well, as I mentioned. Um, don't avoid the Naive Bayes things. Uh, it's, it's, it doesn't work very well, usually. And you, if you do active plus turfing, you would see slightly more errors here. Uh, why? Uh, because the, some of the actives may not be really good ones. So it may be, uh, you know, deceiving the classifier or classifier may be learning something wrong. So this is the initial set setting. So it looks good. Machine learning looks like working. In this work, they, sh they show that now how we could attack this and they look into attacking the scenario. Uh, so basically, they look into, into this optimal evasion attacks. Uh, uh, so basically, what they are trying to do is that based on the features uh, they are using, they try to do evasions. So this is more like the uh, uh, test time type of attack. Uh, so what happens is that uh, it has a per vertical optimal evasion. So each for each instance of a a bad class that tries to find the optimal features to modify to uh, uh, evade the classifier. And then uh, global evasion means that you search for the best features globally and all of the, you apply this to all bad accounts. Uh, and then the feature aware one is alter the known most important features, like you assume some features are known to the attacker and then the attacker chooses those. 
So if you look at these evasion attacks, for example, uh, for different classifiers, here the number of features changed. Of course, as, as, as more features are changed, the more manipulation happens, and the more things becoming uh, misclassified. In other words, after ch in some scenarios such as uh, decision tree, after changing a couple of features, almost 90% or so can evade the detection, okay? But of course, more powerful, I would say, techniques such as random forest requires more manipulation. So I think from here, it shows that, of course, understanding attacker and capabilities is important, but there's a difference between models to models. So more powerful models like random forest, that's the reason I always say that to start with random forest as a baseline, uh, looks like, okay, I want to fall down, uh, looks like uh, giving you a better resistance. And here, this is a global optimal, so the number of, this is, this is effective even with few features, why? Because uh, this is per user, you are choosing the best thing. So here it's a global, so you may need a little bit more to reach the 100% rate, but eventually it's still going there. If you look at decision tree and random forest, they are slightly, still the random forest uh, requires slightly more, but eventually they catch each other. And of course, uh, here uh, it's somewhere in between the SVMs. And also you see similar results here, but here you have uh, a slightly different result, but at the end, all of them really comes uh, and the evasion is successful. Again, why this is possible? Because attacker can easily modify the features that you are, you can, uh, you are using. And uh, these empirical results, again, showing that if this is the case, uh, machine learning technique could be attacked easily. Uh, of course, the previous ones uh, require lots of knowledge about the classifier, what are the best features globally, locally, etc. So basically, uh, in this work, they look into uh, more practical ones. In other words, their argument for more practical, is which, which I would agree as well, is requires less information on the uh, side of the attacker. So for example, in the random evasion attack, so some, of the ran some of the features randomly chosen and changed. Uh, of course, as you see, uh, when you do random features uh, changed, uh, it's not as successful. It requires more and more features actually to even get to 100% rate. So of course, this kind of shows, not surprisingly, more information attacker has, easier for attacker to adapt to classifier. So this is a empirically interesting point, basically, uh, that usually in security, when we talk about, you know, like security of a system, you, you want to disclose everything about the system as much as possible. You don't want to do security by obscurity. But here, of course, obscuring a little bit helps in, the, in that because the attacker may not know the classifier as well, so it's harder for it to adapt to the classifier. The value distance aware strategy and distribution distance aware strategy is uh, assuming that attacker knows something about good class and their value distributions. So it can choose features uh, that are trying to mimic the good class. The difference is not as important, but not surprisingly, if the attacker has more information, it requires less uh, number of features to change. So the more information attacker has, easier to evade. The less information attacker has, it's harder to, harder to evade, basically. So this is uh, an important, I think, distinction uh, from this work. Uh, now, remember, I was also promising you that the, what happens to poisoning attack. So they look at the poisoning attack training data set by injecting random normal users samples to turfing class. So here, uh, ratio of poison to turfing. So you have uh, basically, uh, and you have the false positive rate. So of course, if you add 
more, so this is the ratio, almost 50% poison, 50% ter terfing, you would see that, uh, especially, especially for some classifiers like random forest, the false positive rates move from something to here. Uh, so coming back to early theoretical thing, the, if you still <laughs> remember in the very first part of the tutorial, well, we were saying that as long as the, uh, the beta, in other words, what the malicious attacker can modify is small enough, still we can learn a good classifier. Here, if you look at the ratios, maybe this is, remember this is like a little log scale 0 0.01 to all the way to one. Even if, I don't know what this number here is, that there is a slight increase, even though almost 50%-ish or um, bad data added. So of course this depends on the remember the theoretical result, it depends on the concept, it depends on on the learning algorithm, but this empirical kind of validates this, that. In other words, as long as the poison instances are not too big and if you have a large enough data, the loss in accuracy due to this poisoning doesn't look like too much for uh, strong uh, uh, basically classification techniques. Of course for others uh, like SVM radial function slightly worse and if you look at the decision tree which I, as I mentioned they are not they, they are known to be not very stable that's the reason most people use random force instead of having just one decision tree is doing much worse due to poisoning attack and especially you can see the jump. They look at poisoning between, like the professional workers means like the non, they add poison to authenticated users and then they had all workers and you see similar rich results uh, here as well. Uh, of course, these, they do each experiment n times, I, I think it was 10 times. Uh, just like, so that's the error bars here. Yes, Sting? Which one in this work? This work, the, in, in this one, each worker, uh, f based on the profile, they, ch they, they extracted certain features, okay? They had many, many features. Now, attacker, let's say I'm, I'm a, I have a fake profile, I'm a turfer or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the utility. I don't think they look at the utility in this scenario. They try to limit the utility more like on the number of features. Actually, I was, I was in that talk. <laughs> I was in the talk of this paper a long time ago. I don't think they discussed that, if I'm mistaken, if I'm not mistaken. Correct, that's the reason, I mean, I was talking about at least the other more machinery in the mining work talking about the utility of the attacker, like cost of changing and so on, right? So you need to really look into the cost. So in this scenario, I think they are kind of saying that, for example, uh, attacker can change five features without impacting the uh, bad things that they can do. No, I mean, in, in plus, that's the assumption. I don't think they evaluate it because I don't think they go back to turfers to do anything bad or something like that. They just assume that's the case. Uh, they also look into uh, inject specific type of normal users to turfing class. So in other words, they look into what happens if you add some good data points to the bad class uh, kind of maybe, uh, kind of coming to what you say, so, right, you were inverse. So here they try to inject normal users to turfing class and see how the classifier accuracy is changing there. Again, uh, results are, so they are injecting accounts with 50% 50, 50 TVs commented. So this TVs commented is an important feature that they use. 
So the assumption is that if you have tweets and many people comment to your tweets, then uh, it's, it's a good indication of that your account is legitimate. Again, um, after you add lots of uh, good class, if you think about conceptually is that good class and uh, injected bad class after you inject many, many good accounts look very similar in this point. So therefore, false positive rate jumps up. But again, it can withstand to, to some amount, like I don't know whether this is like where this points here. Similarly, they look at different type of accounts, injecting accounts with less than 150 followers. So they inject certain type of uh, bad accounts. Again, uh, the techniques look like resistance to a point, then it jumps up. So as, as I mentioned, uh, with the theory goes, you, there's a limit that you can handle if you have large enough data to poisoning attacks. So there are a few additional ones. Uh, uh, they also look at uh, the impact of poisoning on, instead of adding any data to the training set, uh, they look into modifying the data in the training set. So for random, so for different classifiers, uh, they look at uh, modifying uh, a different type of data based on some kind of features like entropy measures, bursts. I don't recall what person is like, based on some profile information, changing profile information. These are the feature categories actually they use, and then they change those categories to reflect the other class. And of course, uh, uh, basically uh, changing uh, different features may have different uh, impact on the features uh, that's uh, in terms of uh, classification accuracy. But uh, if you think about features that are non means nothing attacked in this scenario, uh, it looks like uh, here just modifying one feature uh, in one class look like doesn't impact the results as much. So if you see they are somewhat similar, although there are some increases here and there, uh, overall, they look uh, similar. <coughs> so, uh, what all this means, at least from attacker point of view, and coming back to the foundational results, is that uh, I think there is a strong uh, indication that you need to really look into behavioral features. So, the features that are uh, easy to modify, such as the PDF files, uh, you know, strings in it, or uh, online profile or tweet numbers, etc., is uh, quite easy to de detect or quite easy to manipulate. So I chose some examples. Again, there are zillions of papers doing malware, mobile malware detection, but I think uh, Behavioral features, especially if the attacker wants to achieve a certain goal, would be harder to prevent. So, for example, there was the paper yesterday, right? I don't know whether you attended that one, talking about extracting features from papers. And some of the features shown was like sending SMS, whether the, the malware or the software is calling an API function that allows the software to send SMS. It turns out that this is uh, a very good predictor for a um, certain type of malware. And, oops, uh, and it's also uh, uh, hard for attacker to change it, right? If your malware's main point is to send SMS to a certain uh, page sites, whatever you, you may change the software source code, this and that, but it will be very hard to change this SMS sending part because that's the main behavior of the malware. So that's, for that reason, I think uh, looking into behavioral aspects of malicious uh, uh, 
thing done by the attacker, whether it's a spam. Because in the spam, for example, they ask you to click something or go to do some action. Or in terms of malware, where they try to, for example, exfiltrate data or well, they try to send SMS, looks like a, <coughs> a, looks like a better way to do it. I chose one example on this and then there was some discussion yesterday uh, on uh, using, uh, you know, the mining for that. But again, I think the important part is from adversarial aspect is at least uh, from outside, it looks like it will be much harder to ch for attacker to manipulate the behavior. As the previous discussion says that because it wants to achieve this malicious goal it has, maybe all other things uh, may not be as important like, you know, which other API calls it's doing, but it has to do certain API calls to do that. So this example, this paper uh, looks into uh, machine learning uh, behavior, but uh, they look at the runtime behavior of an application. So this is important again, because you can change lots of things in the binary, right? But during runtime, again, the attacker has certain goals, let's say sending SMS or exfiltrating data that will be much, much harder to change. So this is, you can think of it as building a machine learning model based on features that are harder to change by the attacker. Okay, so this work is an example. As I mentioned, there are like zillions of work. I just chose one. And then this is, of course, will be more resilient to worms and code obfuscation and other techniques. Why? Because they are very easy to modify, but not the behavior. Uh, of course, how do you learn the behavior? Uh, what they do is that they trying to, again, learn an SVM model and they try to differentiate uh, partial signature for malicious behavior from normal applications. And in order to do that, they really look into uh, call graph and behavioral things. So what basically they are doing is that they, they try to, uh, by observing lots of uh, runtime behavior of apps, they have normal application patterns and malware, and then they build an SVM and then this SVM is deployed on the smartphone and it will be basically observing the runtime behavior of the application and based on that it tries to classify. So what they are doing is that they try to uh, look into uh, the behavior of a certain uh, type of malware such as the API calls it, do it does and then it tries to create this behavior signature uh, of the API calls or the runtime behavior based on the API calls. And then, uh, of course, it's, it will be harder to build a machine learning model directly on this uh, big function called trees and it may not be as accurate. So instead, uh, they try to uh, aggregate that and try to create some kind of uh, more simplified runtime behavior signature here. And then uh, they, of course, how do they do it? They do like graph pruning and aggregation to come up with this uh, more uh, compact representation of the runtime signatures. And, uh, and this way uh, they could uh, basically uh, uh, they could basically build models. So I, I chose, as I mentioned, as an example of uh, uh, building classifier on harder to evade features, such as the runtime behavior. Uh, of course, now when you go into uh, big data models and then you need to, yeah, go ahead. So the, again, the assumption is that there's here, there's, there's certain, entire assumption is there's certain malware behavior that the malware must be doing to achieve success. So like if the malware is about stealing sensitive information, then it should access that sensitive information. Eventually it should 
send that sensitive information. So if you have a runtime behavior monitoring system that looks at like, you know, doing some taint analysis to figure out where this, whether the sensitive information went to this app and whether it's sent to the internet, that will be very hard to change whatever it does in the middle. Makes, I mean, at least that's my, uh, my intuition. Definitely there will, be, there will be false positive, false negatives, but my only argument is that this will be much harder to evade than a technique that looks at non-behavioral things. Because like, if you look at uh, you know, initial, uh, like the binary for example, that will be much, much harder to do because it can be obfuscated and so on. But in the behavioral scenario, again, it may look like a legitimate app's behavior, but I would be also suspicious if a legitimate app is sending too much sensitive information, for example, to the, to the cloud. So again, of course, there will be some false positives probably, but this will be harder to evade. That's my only argument, because this behavior, by, at least by definition, the adversary tries to achieve. Make sense? Yeah. So basically, this kind of argues that, you know, I mean, I kind of argue that dynamic analysis is harder to evade, obviously. So it's more expensive, probably. Than static analysis, it's much easier to evade because the features in static analysis is very easy to evade in machine learning models. Right? So, I mean, I, I try to tie this to the hard, like the, if you recall the first part, you were saying that choose features that are predictive and harder to manipulate, right? So behavioral features look like those type of features because they are harder to manipulate because uh, malware needs to achieve the intended behavior. And also they are predictive, hopefully more predictive. So that's what's the... Yeah, exactly, exactly. Of course, I mean, that, that's the entire thing. You need to have some set of features that's distinguishing legitimate from the bad, I mean, bad class. Otherwise, there is no hope, obviously, because if all the features you look at, if they are similar, right, then you can't differentiate them. Clearly, that's, that must be the case. You need to have such features. No, no, I mean, what I meant by such a feature is it may not be as simple. So the, what if, if you have if then type of features, it means that classification boundary is simple enough. What I mean, what I mean is that uh, you, you have, if you think about the high dimensional space, the overlap bit based when you project the instances based on the features that you are, you, you are using, there shouldn't be significant overlap between two classes. So remember the, this examples I've, I was, I keep showing. Okay. So remember these examples, right? So this is just two features. And as you see, these two classes well separated. So you need to have set of features on the high dimensional space that doesn't cause too much overlap. It doesn't mean that it's a simple if and then. So if you think about SVMs, they do these kernel tricks to really go into very high dimension space with the kernel trick so that you can get a separation. So it's not as simple as if then. Decision trees are uh, basically, if it's a decision tree, so you have if, here and F then etc. And then you have random forests, but it, it really divides the entire space, especially when you randomize also on the set of features. When you do random forests, it divides the space into different regions where you have different labels. So it, it's slightly more complex than simple if then. And of course, how to learn that if then statements is a challenge and you try to automate that as well. 
So I think I'm not un understanding the question. Yeah. And uh, in, in that case, you always need, you always will have a trade-off between false and, and true detection. Otherwise, you would have hundred percent accuracy, and that's that. That would be very challenging to have hundred percent accuracy. Then that would be uh, deterministic classification. Clearly, there will be errors, and uh, I, clearly there will be some apps who are very legitimate apps, but they may behave like uh, malware in terms of you know, sending lots of sensitive information. So those apps will be classified as malware, even though they may not be malware. And that was, I think, the previous point. So clearly, reaching 100% accuracy is not feasible, I think, for most scenarios, almost all scenarios. I don't think it's feasible. So clearly, you will have false positives, false negatives. That's the reason you need you just don't usually, I mean, I will talk about some criticism of machine learning for in general. Uh, I think uh, there, there is a very nice paper, if you haven't read, I will talk about it. So there is, of course, there's also things, additional things needs to be done. Uh, I, I just throw in uh, another thing, like when you have, uh, yeah, go ahead. Time frame, you mean like how long it takes to do those steps? Yeah. So all, everything, I mean, most of the, uh, if you look at the literature, uh, non-cyber security literature on how long does it take to do, you know, data cleaning, data transformation, feature extraction, they say it takes the 80 to 90% of your total project time. And the 10% is the, doing the data mining machine learning. So usually, you know, get, cleaning the data, extracting the features, etc., is the most time-consuming step. Is that what you are asking? Well, I'm, I think if you get more in practice, if you can, let's say, you had a, you're getting new samples all the time, unlabeled samples, and you're able to determine. Oh, it depends on what type of feature extraction techniques. Most of the examples, like it's one second or something, it's very quick. I think it depends on the techniques. So some for more dynamic analysis techniques needs to, I think, uh, run for a longer time because you want to understand the behavior, right? And during the behavior, uh, you know, on the App Store, uh, they may be, uh, you know, they run this uh, app in a virtual machine type of environment and then they need to observe it for a certain amount of time. So it, it may, and then you have hundreds of thousands of apps, then it may be uh, time consuming. But of course, you can distribute it and do those kind of tricks. So it depends on, again, that's the reason like the future extraction as a cost as well in scenarios. Uh, uh, one, uh, one thing was uh, on how to learn uh, these kind of behavioral models in the big data setting. Uh, there was some work, people looking to like uh, distributing the data mining of this uh, into the mobile cloud or mobile devices themselves instead of sending each data extracted from a different mobile device to the cloud and build the data mining model. Some people look into how to do this in a distributed fashion. And in order to deal with big data, usually uh, distributed uh, classification is the way to go. Uh, based in this work, they did divide this quadratic SVM binary classification into smaller problems uh, so that it could be solved by a uh, distributed scenario. And uh, they, they look at, uh, uh, oops, uh, they look at uh, ba basically uh, using this distributed technique uh, for uh, accuracy and here contaminated samples means there is a malware normal samples means the normal scenario here you learn again behavioral uh, SVMs uh, and so on 
but uh, you have uh, you do it in a distributed manner so you don't need to send everything back to the cloud for doing learning and task and so on uh, so they are kind of sh showing that this is requires less interaction less activation for the mobile devices uh, Again, I just want to give one example here. There are many, many papers who look into distributed learning scenarios. Uh, before I finish, I want to uh, look into, an, uh, I think, an excellent paper, I think six years ago or so, on criticism of machine learning. And I want to tie back with some of the theoretical things we discussed. Uh, and this, 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 the title of this work was the outside the closed world on using machine learning for network intrusion detection. Uh, this paper really tried to differentiate between misuse detection, like uh, precise descriptions of normal malicious behavior versus animal detection, in other words, deviation from normal activities. And then uh, it really uh, looked into several problems, uh, such as high false positive rate, this is still a problem uh, because uh, there is no 100% accurate machine learning technique and usually an analyst needs to look at the final result. So how, how does it impact the analyst's time and so on? And then they also say that lack of uh, attack-free data for training is an issue. But as the theoretical results indicate, if you have big enough data and if the contamination is not too large, like the previous examples show, I think this, is, this, this shouldn't be a problem, but again, this paper mentions it as, a, as an important problem. And then they say that, oh, look, attackers can fall the system, await the detection. Again, the entire first part of the talk was about how to have more resistant techniques uh, to do that. And finally, should they mention what dif difficulties with evaluation? Uh, one thing which I didn't discuss today, and I think it's a very important uh, issue, is is the semantic gap and the interpretation of the results, basically. And uh, that's, I guess, biggest criticism which hasn't been addressed as well. In other words, uh, when you come throw in a complex machine learning model uh, such as SVM over thousands of features and it comes up with a model and says this is this is benign or this is not benign what does it mean okay why it says so and that's really hard to hard to interpret there are some work in machine learning things especially like decision tree or uh, random forest where you could get more human understandable outputs but still there is a semantic gap is there and of course uh, the error costs is sometimes could be high in the networking setting like when you do false positives false negatives but i think this is kind of being addressed nowadays with the classifiers that get these costs into it Outlier detection uh, is which we didn't touch as much but outlier detection of course uh, happens because some normal behavior look like an outlier due to changes and so on, still you need to have some kind of human in the loop. So that's where the human uh, come into play. So this is uh, just uh, uh, basically an uh, active area in a sense. You need to add all those, uh, those aspects. Uh, so what, what this paper's recommendation was, understanding the thread model is important. Uh, and still, I think this is the, also all the theoretical models look into, like what kind of environment does the system target? What do the missed attacks uh, cost? What the attackers' skills and resources? And uh, what concern does evasion pose? So this is, I think, uh, their recommendation. And the theoretical models have similar recommendations. In a sense, if you if you remember, all of these models try to really actively uh, try to answer these questions and model these questions to come up with more resistance model. I think keeping the scope narrow. It's the, again these are their suggestions. Uh, uh, so you usually 
building a classifier to predict some subtask is easier than, let's say, more generic task. What I mean by is, let's say you want to build a classifier on Twitter to figure out all public unrests, okay? It's usually much harder to, for example, build a classifier just predicting uh, protests or just predicting, let's say, riots or something. So it's usually easier to do classifiers predicting some certain subclass instead of a generic class. So there, the scope narrow is that maybe you can have multiple classifiers instead of just one big one. So that's the idea. Of course, uh, reducing the cost means that, uh, you know, there is the cost involved from the evasion attacker points and you need to consider those. Of course, evaluation is, I think, the semantic gap uh, of understanding results are still there. Oops. So, uh, I think I'll finish a little bit early. Uh, sorry. Uh, so, to conclude, uh, I know there are uh, uh, many uh, uh, results we discussed. Uh, this, this is, uh, by the way, their conclusion. I will come to our conclusions in a second. Uh, they're, they are saying that this, there is this domain-specific challenge of applying machine learning-based detection techniques and deploy them. Uh, but as I mentioned at the very beginning now, there are startups who are trying to change that. So there are now many startups who are trying to do machine learning based detection systems and try to deploy them. So it's, I think, changing. Uh, and then uh, obtaining, of course, insights from the domain experts and bringing semantic understanding into the machine learning domain, I think, is an active area. In other words, like combining machine learning automated data analysis techniques with human intuition is the, the, the recent active research. The machine learning community has done uh, active learning work uh, in the past, they called active learning, but I think this is an important uh, aspect as well. Again, this is from the citation number nine, so this is my conclusion, sorry, <laughs> there's a confusion. Uh, to summarize what I'll try to com uh, convey, I guess, with all the equations, uh, applying data mining for cyber security really requires better understanding of attackers. So it's not surprising for, I think, cyber security people, but just applying machine learning data mining techniques itself doesn't solve. As you see, the foundational results like game theory provides some natural tools for modeling. Uh, but uh, uh, it, it's, it's just to get some intuitions maybe. Uh, and you really need to figure out at least the, the adversaries' capabilities, their uh, adaptation, their cost of adaptation, and the utility for the attacker and defender for certain options. At least all the theoretical models indicate that that needs to be considered to have an effective uh, long-term solution. Uh, I haven't discussed many, many things. One example is provenance of data, like where the data is coming from, who touched it, may have important implications for building the mining models. Uh, and against poisoning attacks, for example, which is itself is important. And there are many other issues that I didn't touch, but I try to at least highlight the differences of machine learning and mining for cybersecurity. So I, I guess this is, all this theoretical stuff is not so far away from ancient wisdom. Uh, I, I think uh, this is a couple of thousand years old, right? So you need to, uh, if you know, you need to know the enemy and yourself. So here, in order to really apply machine learning for uh, data mining or big data for uh, cybersecurity, you need to know the enemy and you need to know the potential adaptations. Otherwise, uh, it will not be very useful. This means that choose uh, the features very carefully. So the rights of, uh, of features, I think, are more important than uh, the data mining models that you are using. But of course, as we have seen in some examples, robust machine learning techniques uh, are better. And final thing is the big data. Remember I, in the title I had the big or sexy part. So what does the big data involve? Of course, you need to scale to large data because the data is getting larger. Uh, 
I think choosing right of features, uh, right features for classification says good features are really hard for attacker to manipulate and they are indicative of attack. So in other words, a feature that is hard to manipulate and uh, differentiates good versus bad in terms of like information to sense, etc. That's a good feature. And if you build good features, uh, if you build classifiers, machine learning models based on such good features, at least the theory suggests they are more likely to, uh, to withstand the evasion attacks and so on. So we were talking about malware detection. So in the malware detection this says that, you know, synthetic features extracted from binary will, should be quickly useless. An attacker could quickly adapt to that because the change cost is very little. But behavioral features is probably harder to uh, modify because it requires changing the behavior of the malware, which is substantially harder. Um, of course, now, like, what's the right machine learning tool? Uh, I don't touch on this area. There is so hot topic like deep belief networks. Uh, you know, it's now, if you have a startup on anything deep belief network, uh, it's, it's highly valued. So it's a, now the hype uh, thing. Uh, there are, of course, many techniques, tools to be used. So I think using different tools and so on could be, cr could be critical. But of course, more resistant tools such as, you know, random force or we have some candidates such as SVM uh, could be a better idea. But of course, there may be others. So I don't think there is one right machine learning technique for one detection. So you need to really try them for your task and see, of course, after coming, starting with the good features. In other words, the features that are hard for attacker to manipulate and indicative of attack, basically. In the previous examples, we talk about like sending SMS. Maybe it's only few of the legitimate apps send SMS. Let's say if that's the case, that's a good feature for against an SMS malware. Uh, I didn't talk too much uh, on this uh, on this part uh, of uh, efficient distributed processing. Uh, you could give an uh, entire two days tutorial on any one of them. Uh, and actually, if you Google online, you would find, you know, uh, topics on these big data management systems. So current uh, uh, intuition is that if in order to scale to big data, you really need to have some kind of distributed processing system built on top of, uh, built on, t on, on top of, com uh, standard commercial hardware. The early example was Hadoop MapReduce popularized by uh, Google. Uh, and then there is now Spark, I would say, becoming at least my favorite tool uh, used on top of uh, Hadoop. And there are a few others on, they call it NoSQL database systems. And I will just mention Spark briefly. Uh, because uh, Spark is basically a fast general purpose cluster computing system. So you can have 100 machines and you can go for terabytes of data. And the nice thing about these kind of tools is that it has APIs in many, many languages such as Java, Scala, Python. And then uh, they have an optimized engine that supports uh, general execution graphs. I'm not... Uh, going too much into the spark it was my initial thing but i realized that it will require maybe like one hour itself to even give basic ideas of how spark works and the libraries and so on but uh, here from from our purpose is that uh, if you have a one terabyte of data and you want to build machine learning models to, for that you can't do it on one machine you need to distribute but of course instead of running your own distributed code to learn these models. There is already things like Apache Spark and Hadoop and so on, where you can use the things. Spark is especially interesting because it has uh, machine learning libraries already on it. And this SVM, random forest, uh, naive base, and there are some also clustering techniques that are automatically built there. And they are built in a way that it could, the model learning itself could be distributed. So therefore, uh, 
once you figure out good features and nice techniques and so on, you need to distribute it for the big data. And these uh, kind of Spark type of things can do it automatically for you without need to worry about uh, the, like scaling by yourself. And as I mentioned, it has lots of libraries. Uh, I won't be uh, talking about uh, those libraries as much, uh, but as I mentioned, they implement most common machine learning tools, uh, such as random forests and so on. And uh, they have support for like Java, Scala, Python, so you can write easily code on that. And there are other, f other things like Spark Streaming, uh, which is interesting if you want to update your models on the fly. So you can have a streaming framework where you can, the data is keep coming and you change or updating model. So that's also possible. So I stop here, that was my acknowledgement. Uh, I will stop 20 minutes earlier. I guess no, you didn't ask too many questions. Uh, but uh, I will share the slides uh, online and I will put a few more pointers to Spark for those anyone, I, I know most people know it, but uh, it's there. So and I would be happy to answer more questions. So that's what I have. Thanks. I will put the slides online and I think they will link uh, from the website, but you can send me an email if you can't find the link from my website. Thanks, thanks for coming. <laughs>